Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Ned Bellavance, Ned1313 on Twitter, and welcome to the Daily Check-In for December 18th, 2020. Today's topic is, hey, I'm studying for the CKA, and I am diving into the first objective in one of the domains, and it's all about managing RBAC in Kubernetes. So that's what we're going to talk about in this video. I'm going to dive into what I've learned so far and maybe you know, help you understand a few things along the way. So we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, if you're interested in knowing more about what I'm doing for the study process, I, I am publishing the guide that I'll show you in a moment. When I say publishing, it's already available on GitHub. So it's free open source. You can check it out. Hopefully it's helpful to you. I'm really just writing it because when I write things, I remember them better. So I'm kind of doing it for both of us. Um, that's all I have about that. This is probably going to be a lot of information, so I don't want to dawdle too much on the intro. I do want to check in with you. How you doing? Happy Friday. Hopefully for some of you, this is this is it until the new year. You've taken some kind of vacation, and this is, this is the last hurrah. Probably not doing a whole lot of work today, and I know uh, I tried to take it a little easy myself, and next week... Um, I mean, I'm still going to be doing my videos, but I'm going to be coasting on a lot of other work-related items because it's the holidays for the next two weeks, basically, and I'm, I'm going to enjoy that. So I hope that you are going to enjoy it as well. Let's talk about managing RBAC in the world of Kubernetes. So when I got started on this, I had some understanding of what was going in, on in role-based access control when it came to Kubernetes, but it had a lot of questions as well because I didn't quite understand what was going on exactly. Some of it I could just interpret by looking at a manifest for a cluster role or for a role, but I didn't really know what's the difference between a cluster role and a role. What And, and like, I knew you could do cluster role bindings and role bindings, but what were the limitations on that? And how do you refer to a user versus a group versus what else was supported? These are all questions I had. And so that is what I started studying up on and learning. So let me go ahead and I'll just share out my screen here. So this is the guide I'm working on. It's all done in Markdown. So we're looking at the Markdown preview right now. And the thing that I want to start with is when you think about role-based access control, it's within the larger idea of AAA in Kubernetes, which includes authentication, authorization, and then auditing. Now, we're not worried about auditing in this, and we're not really worried about authentication because that's actually handled through an authentication module. So you load an authentication module, authenticator module, that takes care of the actual authentication, like using Active Directory or LDAP or some web-based authentication service. That, that's going to run on the API server, and that has its own responsibility. So that's not really in scope for this particular objective. Maybe it is further down, but for right now, let's not worry about that. The thing that we're worried about is authorization, which is what are you allowed to do? What did I just do? Authorization is what are you allowed to do? And that is configured through role-based access control. Now, once I started do some, doing some reading, I realized there's actually three different authorization modules in Kubernetes. There's ABAC, RBAC, and Webhook. But the exam is focused on RBAC, so don't worry about the other two. Not really a big deal. Uh, and then another thing that came up was admission control and ad Admission controllers can modify or reject a request when it comes in. So when you are making a request against the API server to do something, you are going to make the request, you're going to provide your authenticated token, and it's going to look at your permissions for your role and see if you're able to do whatever the action is on the desired resource. Admission controllers can add another layer on top of that to modify a request or just reject it out of hand, but they're not exactly RBAC. So let's focus on RBAC. The API group that is behind RBAC is rbac.authorization.k8s.io. So you're going to see that a lot when you're creating roles and cluster roles. This is the API group that all of that stuff belongs to. Okay, pretty cool. Now, there are four basic API objects in RBAC, and I kind of mentioned them already, but just to clarify here, you've got role. Oh my goodness, why does that keep happening? That's not helpful. <clears throat> you've got role. So a role sets permissions in the context of a namespace. So roles are namespace specific. Role binding 
is what binds that role to a list of subjects. And we'll get to subjects in a second. A cluster role allows you to set permissions in a non namespace context. So you're not locking the permissions and the resources down to a single namespace. You're a, a level removed. You're working at the cluster level. And then you use a cluster role binding to bind a cluster role to a list of subjects. And interestingly enough, you can actually bind a cluster role with a role binding. And we'll see like a little bit about that in a minute. Okay. So subjects. This is the confusing part. And I was like, where are the users stored in Kubernetes? And where are the groups? And the answer is they're not stored in Kubernetes. They're stored in that authenticator module. So there are three types of subjects. And the first two, the users and the groups, those are both stored in the authenticator module. And they need to be exposed to Kubernetes. So you can refer to a user. And the reference is going to be a string of some kind. You can't prefix the string with system because that's reserved by Kubernetes. But you're just going to have a string and it refers to a user that could be just their name. It could be like their username at example.com. It could be a unique ID, whatever you want. That's something that you figure out between the authenticator module and the RBAC system. But point is, it's a string groups, same thing. It's a string. Service accounts are something that lives and resides inside Kubernetes, and it will be prefixed with system colon service account colon. You won't see this a lot when you're looking through the YAML. You'll usually just see it that you're defining a type of the resource type is service uh, service account, and then you refer directly to that service account. Like I said, the restriction is you can't use the prefix system for uh your Kubernetes subjects for users and groups because that's reserved by Kubernetes. So like, don't try it. Things can get wonky, but that might be something that comes up in the exam. Maybe something, maybe a user is named with that service pre system prefix and that's why things are breaking with RBAC. So just like keep that in the back of your mind. Whenever you see something that's reserved or not allowed or you're not supposed to do, think to yourself, ah, if I get to the troubleshooting part of the exam, that might be something that they break on purpose, which I then have to fix. All right, now let's talk about roles. What's in a crazy, what's in a role? Well, like I said, it's namespaced. So in the metadata for the role, you're gonna specify not just the name of the role, but also the namespace where that role should exist, which means you can't now assign this role or bind this role to a user on a different namespace. This is this exists in the context of one namespace. Okay. And then below the metadata, you have rules. And in rules, you can define API groups. So that could be a grouping of different APIs where you want this applicable to, resources you want this applied to, resource names. You can get as granular as actually calling out individual resource resources by their name. And then the verbs are what actions are allowed. And there's an implied deny. If it's not in this list of verbs, you can't do it. So if you don't give someone, you know, delete in the verbs, they don't have delete permissions on that resource. Okay, makes sense. And then if you wanted to create it imperatively, there is a command called kubectl create role that you can use to create a role instead of using a manifest. Cool. Role bindings. All right, now we're getting into role bindings. Again, role bindings are going to be namespaced because roles are namespaced. And in this case, you're going to give it a name and you're going to specify the namespace where this role binding is occurred. And the role that you're going to refer to down here where it says role ref, well, that role has to be in that namespace or it's not going to work. And then here under subjects, this is the thing I was talking about, you're going to have a list of subjects that you want to bind in this role binding, and you can specify users, groups, and service accounts. Boom. All right, cool. The role referral is just going to be a single entry. The kind could be role or cluster role. And I, I mentioned this before, so maybe I should get into this a little bit. You can have a cluster role that defines permissions for resources. And then you can assign it using a role binding. And now that cluster role is only applicable in that namespace that you've specified in the role binding. So that's a way to create a higher level construct, something like an admin role, and then bind that cluster admin role 
down to a specific namespace that you just want to give, you know, Jimmy Joe or Sally Sue admin rights on that specific namespace. That's a way to do it. Okay. Now I broke them down a little bit in the doc, but uh, hopefully it makes sense. Cluster role, like I mentioned before, cluster role is a role, but it's not constrained by a namespace. So that's pretty useful. So instead of you giving it in the metadata saying namespace, all you do is say name. You just say name. That's it. You're good. And then same as before, you set up API groups, resources, and verbs. Now you're not going to see resource names in there because that wouldn't make any sense in the context of a cluster role. Scrolling down a little bit more, we get into another slight thing, and I didn't even know this existed. So this is kind of cool. Cluster role aggregation. The idea here is you could have a cluster role that aggregates other cluster roles together. And the way that it does that is it matches on a label. So it looks for any other cluster roles that have this exact label in them. You know, it could be aggregate to admin is true. And this is actually how the default admin cluster role functions is it looks for any other roles that have this label on it and then it aggregates them all together. So if you looked at the rules, if you were defining one of these, you'd leave the rules empty and those rules are gonna get populated by Kubernetes when it sees other cluster roles that have that label in them. So that's pretty cool, right? And there's a bunch of different reasons you could do that. The one that I that made sense to me is if I'm creating a new custom role definition, or not custom, a custom resource definition, and I want to provide a certain level of permissions to that CRD, I can define a cluster role for that CRD and then add one of these labels so it'll automatically be included in the admin role, let's say. So that's that's like pretty useful. Okay, cool. Cluster role binding. Obviously, this is just like role binding, except you're binding it to a cluster role and it takes effect at the cluster level when you do this binding because it's not namespace. So if you want to give someone like global permissions across the entire cluster, you can do that with a cluster role binding. And you'll see this if you want to give someone cluster admin permissions, you could do a cluster role binding to the cluster admin role, uh, cluster role, and you'd be good to go. I said cluster a lot. My goodness. All right. Wrapping up here, a few other things to note, default roles. I've already mentioned this a few times. So there are default roles here and role bindings when you set up Kubernetes, it automatically creates these things. And some of the, the default roles are all down here. We'll get to those in a second. When Kubernetes starts up, it looks at these default roles and the default role bindings, and it has a pre-existing corpus of knowledge of what those things should be. They're defined outside of, I'm not sure where they're defined, so that's something I need to find out. But it will compare what it knows those roles and role bindings to be to what they are, and if they're different, it will overwrite what's there. The reason it does that is for auto, it's, it, the process is called auto reconciliation, and it's meant to keep your settings current. It also means if you upgrade the version of Kubernetes, it will also update all of those default cluster roles and cluster role bindings. You can opt out of that because the way that it does this is it looks for an annotation that is auto update set to true. If you set one of the cluster roles to false, it's not gonna auto update it, which could be really bad. Like, so don't do that unless you're 100% sure that there's a good reason to do it. Okay, and then lastly, to wrap up, the five categories of roles that you should keep in mind. API discovery. These are default role bindings and roles that are for public accessibility. So it, the basic user cluster role is in there and it's for unauthenticated and authenticated users and it uses the system prefix. So you can, if you look at all the cluster roles, system ones with system prefix might be in the API discovery, but it lets unauthenticated users do a little bit of discovery on the system so they can, you know, figure out how to access it maybe. The next one is user facing. So user facing roles are like the admin role that we saw before. They're not gonna have that system prefix and they're meant to be associated with users and groups and possibly service accounts. Core component and other component are the other two. So core component and other component. And these are for components inside Kubernetes that may or may not have a cert that will have like a service account and they're gonna get associated with these cluster roles so that they can do their job inside of the cluster.
And then lastly, there's built-in controller roles, and these are pre prefixed with system colon controller. So that's how you know that they're for the built-in controllers. And this will bind these roles to a controller running on Kubernetes. It'll bind it to their service account, or it will use the default credential for the main controller loop if you're not using service accounts. So that is, <laughs> that's a lot of information I just dumped on you, but that and in a nutshell is managing RBAC and using in Kubernetes. There's a bunch of command line stuff that you definitely wanna practice. I'm gonna be practicing it to understand how to create these manifests, but also how to do it imperatively because that might be something that comes up. So just good to know what those CLI commands are. That's really all I have for today. Hey, before I go, are you a patron? Are you are you a patron like these cool guys right here? If not, you could be. You certainly could be. I have a Patreon. It is down in the description. If you're enjoying these videos, they're free, and so is this guide, and you want to support me in some small way, I would 100% appreciate it. And if you uh, go in at the middle tier or the upper tier on my Patreon, your name appears in this box with these two fine gentlemen. And I can make that box bigger and the font smaller. So don't worry, there is room for you. If you can't, that's cool too. Sharing and subscribing is another awesome way to say thank you. So I do appreciate that. And if you don't want to do any of that, well, just know that I'm thinking about you and I think you're awesome. So that's all I got for today. Until next time, stay healthy, stay safe out there. Bye for now.